Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful festival so far. You're all happy to be back? We're here, we're, we're going strong. There's trickles and diff slight difficulties, but yeah, after three years, that's not surprising. We have a folky institution on stage. We, absolutely. <laughs> I've only been in the Folky um, family for the last uh, 13, 14 years, and I'm sure these two have been here for a lot longer. Um, I've heard their names many times, and I've listened to their music and their stories many times, and I've always enjoyed it. The Fagan Trio is a duo today, so we have Margaret and Bob, and I'm sure they will take you on a wonderful journey. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Yes, I guess you've heard Kate and her entire family have had COVID, have COVID, just coming out of it, but not quite in time to get to the national alas. Okay, thanks very much for coming. And thank you, Wayne. Here's Wayne Richmond. Kate said to me, oh, will anybody record it? I said, oh, I don't think so. She said, where's Wayne Richmond when you're there? <laughs> and here he is. In the front row. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, everybody, for coming uh, to hear something. Some of you will have heard some of it before, uh, which is good, because uh, they're great songs. And that, what we what we love is singing these songs, and that's what we try and do most of. But it's a more kind of relaxed atmosphere where, if you want to know anything about the songs, we can tell you, and uh, so you can ask us while we're going. And I'll try not to tell you too much about the songs because we, we do want to sing nicely. And it, it, it's about the legacy of a group, a fairly small group of poets in Sydney who were part of a bigger group around Australian capital cities called the Realist Writers. And I've got to be careful not to launch into anything about realism and socialist realism and what it is. I could do that in a pub afterwards. Uh, but these writers were held together by a love of poetry. They weren't professional poets, most of them at the time, but some of them became very famous poets. But this was the early part of the, the, their life in the late 40s, early 50s. Frank Hardy had written a very famous novel that got slammed for libel, became very famous on the left because of that libel case. He set up the Sydney Realist Writers Group when Melbourne got too hot for him and he came up to Sydney. And the first song we'll sing is often thought of as a folk song. The first two songs we'll sing were listed in the Australian Encyclopedia as folk songs, collected in the Hunter Valley. And fortunately or unfortunately for the manager, they appointed me as the industrial editor of the entries. And I knew that both of the songs were written by Dorothy Hewitt on her kitchen table in Rosebury in Sydney in the mid-1950s. And that kind of, kind of got us off the ground. And that song is Weevils in the Flower, which David, Mul David Mulholland, anybody remember him from the ABC? He thought this might have been a candidate for Australia's national anthem. I'm glad it was. It certainly is an anthem, isn't it? It's called Weevils in the Flower, which is not the title of Dorothy's poem. Her title was called Where I Grew to Be a Man, a much longer poem, and I'll explain that afterwards. Please sing along if you know the chorus, but I think you have to sing in a very, very small space around yourself. Oops.
city of Newcastle and also a wonderful person who was um, very instrumental in those early days of the realist and it was based on her father's story. Yeah, her dad's story and um, it was a long poem but uh, a friend of Dorothy Hewitt's family um, in Sydney, um, Mike Layden, set it to music in a wonderful setting. So the other thing that's very interesting to us this morning is the settings the musical settings that were kind of inspired by those um, songs, uh, songs made from the poems. And uh, Dorothy was, um, she was in the Realist Writers from 56 when it started. She left in 66. In fact, she left in a blaze. Dorothy did most of the things in a blaze. And she wrote an article that just published in Perth saying, Realist Writers has done a good job, but it's time to go. See you later. And she was right that everybody left. And uh, 56 was a year in which a lot of people left the Australian Communist Party, and uh, we won't go into that now. And, um, because of hungry. There's, there's a whole lot of uh, life left in the realist poets. Um, and so this morning we've got a group of these originals and some of their, the settings of their songs. 
We then move on to Dennis Kevins, who was the secretary of the Realist Writers Group. He was just a young, early 20s man. And he left to, well, they dissolved. They'd, they'd done a job and moved on. And um, Dennis will, will talk about some of his later stuff. And then we'll finish with the block of Alastair Hewlett songs. And Alastair, unlike the other poets, Alastair has a chorus in a song which explains why he's still a, a realist. Um, so I might, if I've got time, sing the chorus to that song. Um, and we're very fortunate to have Chris Mulder here because he's going to come up and help us in the Alastair section, given that our Kate can't be here. So, how lucky are we? Sound people, wonderful singers, and a great audience. So let's go. This one's called The Ballad of Norman Brown, and the editor of the Australian Encyclopedia could not believe that this was not written by a local coal miner. And Dorothy said she was picked up once on the way to a fellowship at the University of Newcastle, and the person driving the car, as they were driving past Kurugan Island on the other side, she said, he said, Do you know that an unknown steel worker wrote a song called Weavers in the Flower? <laughs> Dorothy thought, shall I tell him <laughs> now or just keep quiet? This is I called. Am that work. Yeah, I am that still work. Yeah. Um, this is the ballad of Norman Brown to the tune of the Collier Laddie, which was set by John Meredith. And there's a bit of a myth being around, I don't know, maybe only in my head, that there was some sort of separation between the Bush music uh, musicians and the realist writers. There wasn't. A lot of people were members of both. And John Meredith is one of those people editor of Sing About published this ballad first in Sing About as a song, Ballad of Norman Brown. There was a very, oh geez, I do this, I kind of know, <laughs> and then I completely forget it and I sing it in the key. She usually no. sings the right key though. So the key is going to be B. So that's okay isn't it? Yeah. That's Kate's pitch box, me. so she's here. <laughs> there was a very simple man, honest and quiet, yet he became the mate of every mining man, and every miner knows his name. Oh, Norman Brown, oh, Norman Brown, the murdering coppers, they shot him down. They shot him down in Rothbury Town. A working man called Norman Brown. An honest man, the parson said, and dropped the claw. Yes. Okay. 
music is in his hand. His song is shouted through the land. A land that's free and broad and brown. The land that bred us Norman Brown. Oh, Norman Brown, oh, Norman Brown. The murdering coppers, they shot you down. Somebody came up and told us that uh, she was Norman Brown's niece. And uh, did I know that uh, Norman was just a young fella, probably uh, an innocent bystander, innocent bystander, so-called, at the picket line where the police opened fire. Dorothy had no doubts who shot the miners because in her poem she says, the murdering bosses, they shot you down. She knew that the police had killed them but they pulled the trigger for various reasons, but the bosses had blocked the miners out at Rockbury. So we'll sing a song written by uh, Dorothy's partner, Merv Lilly, um, and it's called Birchgrove Park, and it's one of the poems that was set by Bill Berry, who was in the Trade Union Choir of Queensland in those days, and Bill had a fantastic repertoire of songs, what a troubadour Bill Berry was lived in the Blue Mountains for quite a long time and a good friend of Merv and Dorothy's and they ended up in the mountains too as of we as is Andy <laughs> so it's a place where you can go and sing in Park Manningham's So the Birchgrove Park the um, subject of this song was a, a collier ship that did the run from Newcastle down to Sydney back and forth and uh, one night it was only a little boat if you look at pictures of it, amazing um, on the, the run home. And Merv Lily was telling me that this was what they called a job and finish. So they'd done a lot of runs and they were keen that it was the end of, end of the runs and they were going to have some time off in Sydney town. And Merv also said, um, there's, a, there's a mention of lights. And he said, we always looked at those glittering lights as we were coming into Sydney. And it was just so exciting to get, get back to, to town and get in towards the lights. So, um, a very bad storm came up and um, you'll hear what happens in the story of the Virtue Oh, yeah. 
little first group of songs. I mean, again, the answer's on the songs, but I can't help saying something else uh, before we get to the next song, and that is three things that struck us about this little group and why we think it's worth even, even doing a, a, a sort of theme about this. Uh, one is that they're not bush music songs, they're about the urban industrial Australia that I actually grew up in, but I was fortunate in a way to grow up in Canberra and uh, I didn't know what an urban industrial city was really like until I moved to Sydney to actually get a job and um, <laughs> I couldn't believe it even though I stayed there 38 years or something. Despite being born in Birmingham. I was born in Birmingham, <laughs> but I lived on a, a dairy farm in Gloucestershire so I didn't know the city's front of the of me. But the urban industrial Australia of the 60s um, was represented in a, an album that I got in 1965 by Gary Shearston, and it was called Australian Broadside, and I felt as though I'd been hit by a cannonball, no doubt. And I didn't realise till much later that half of the songs on Australian Broadside were written by this group of realist writers. And uh, I'll sing another one, not by one that Gary recorded. Oh, and the third thing I wanted to say, always lose count. Uh, that was a technique I used when I was being interviewed. They'd, they'd say, well, what do you think about that? And I'd say, well, there are four things about that, because I knew if you numbered them, they'd never interrupt you until you got to the fourth one. Then you Kerry O'Brien was smart to that one. So, so this is a song called Minus Cavill, which was written by a guy from um, Curry Curry in New South Wales, and he was actually at the Norman Brown, the Rothbury Riot, but he wasn't on on that day, so he wasn't on the picket line. And his name was Jock Graham, and he later on, a member of the Communist Party, became a, a very well-known member of the local government. He was on the council for years, Jock, a uh, Communist Party member of the council. Uh, they did well in local government. There was a Communist Party local government in the Queensland coal town, way up near Townsville once, and the president was also the president of the Country Women's Association, which reminds me that one of the reasons Dorothy said she left the Realist Writers because the orientation was very much in the mould of the party to get published, and it was about mostly men, mostly white, in factories. And Dorothy said, We've done that, but we can't do it any longer. She never wrote in that genre again after she left in 1966. Jock Graham did write in that genre because he was an elderly man at the Rothbury, uh, no, not elderly at Rothbury, but by the 1960s when Warren uh, collected some material, Warren Fay collected some material from Jock, he was in his 80s. And this is called the Miner's Cable, it's the ballot that miners used to go in every day. We were happy coal cobbers for many's a year. Me mate Jimmy Doolan and me. We had fought for mine safety when danger was there, and the lodge backed us up to the tee. We cavils that place down in three panel east. The roof sounds as hard as a bell. But it's treacherous kind of, I toil like a beast It's as hot as the hot plates in hell Well the boring is hard as the brass here and there We were never the fellas to growl But the cutting is tough and the air with the damp The damp and the coal dust is foul the wheeler is shouting for coal with a curse A man's holding on to his gut And the board's nearly bare and what's bloody worse I still haven't finished the cut So Jimmy says I that'll do mate for that Let's get boring and get us some coal For his kid is each need a new suit and a hat and his dad's on the bloody red roll Well, we bought up and fired But God help the suits Cos I'm hearing me mate singing low 
Well, the whole bloody lot I could put in me boot. Yeah, the worst bloody miner I know. Then the wheeler came in for another three ton. Fill them up, mate, there's no time to mag. Keep your old banjo swinging, it's near half past ten. And we four more to fill for the dag. We just topped the last and we're making the crack About having ten shifts for the pay When down came a floater right on my mate's back We buried poor Jimmy today We just topped the last and we're making the crack About having ten shifts for the pay when down came a floater right on my mate's back we buried poor jimmy today um, the cable was the ballot and uh, because the many, many years before, after an industrial dispute, the miners' union insisted on taking over, allocating the, the jobs. And they did it with the sort of short straws or whatever you could pick. That, that meant you could distribute the dangerous mines throughout the workforce. So the bosses couldn't say, well, you're a bit of a stirrer. You can go in at three panel east and keep them down there for a couple of weeks till you say, oh, I won't be a stirrer anymore. Don't send me to three panel east. Um, so the unions took that power and they also set the DAG, spelt D-A-R-G, uh, which was the production quota they had to fill for the day. And the wheeler was the bloke who shoveled and took the wheels, took the trolleys from the face to the pit ponies in the case of Curry Curry and Pelham Collier. I went down there once, I'm claustrophobic and the pit ponies were there in the 1980s. <laughs> Do another one from the pen of uh, Dorothy Hewitt now, with a lovely tune written by um, Bill Berry, another Bill Berry tune. And uh, this was written when Merv was working on the ships out from Fremantle, and she wrote a, a love song for Merv when they were over in the west there. It's called Sailor Home from the Sea.
Barry set that actually to a slowed down version of the Irish traditional tune, the Orange Flute. If anybody picked that up, and you and McCall did the same thing to the firemen's, not for me. Merv Lilly worked for a time on the uh, the docks out of. Um... I was just so surprised to see two lovely friends walk in. I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> he worked on the docks out of Sydney, and this is one that's set in that area. And we had the great pleasure of singing this for the down at Barangaroo when that was open, and when they were renaming the Hungry Mile. So that that was. That was an exciting day for that road, that street, to be renamed the Hungry Mile. So, I think of I think of uh, that when I think of when I sing this song. And um, Merv said, when they were all gathering around trying to get a job on the wharves, you know, there'd be a certain number of jobs, but there'd be, be so many people needing the few jobs that were coming up. And that term was known as seagulling. So, you know, like seagulls all hanging around to get one scrap of food, so... And he uses the imagery of um, seagulls in this song. It's called The Pick-Up Shed, trying to pick up a job. The Pick-Up Shed. that supported uh, the workers, and that's what the realists were about. Uh, Frank Hardy's big project was to write the working class uh, stories of Australia, and he had in mind writers like um, Balzac, painters like Goya, all sorts of imaginative stuff, but 
it, uh, it sort of came to a, a halt for all sorts of reasons which we won't go into now. But um, that's the sort of thing that stimulated these settings. And I do hear a kind of an Australian musical voice in that pickup shed. Uh, I just, it sounds to me like a kind of 1960s sound. And that's what struck me so much when I heard that record, um, Australian Broadside. Um, so now we're actually going to follow Dennis Kevins into his uh, 40s and 50s. And he was, um, I thought, I've read the thing wrong with it. No, I was getting my glasses. What information do you need? Because I can't see it. I can give you some information. Yeah, that's right. Took 20 minutes to do this to clear his monuments and sit in. Yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So um, this song was written by Dennis because he was a school teacher um, and while he was doing his uni uh, courses, he worked as a builder's labourer, so he was in the BLF. And um, uh, Dennis was very influential at what they called smokers and the meetings that they used to have. Um, I said, said this yesterday when uh, Greg North was launching um, Dennis's poetry book. And um, it, it, Dennis was, uh, he, he was a kind of a, the poet for the, the green bands in some ways. And this is one of the songs he wrote for a smoker, just, just for a, a social gathering to get the unionists to support Jack Mundy, who was a bit of a maverick to say the least within the union movement. Poor monuments. I'll tell you who wrote the tunes afterwards. I'm sorry I've been a bit remiss on that. Some leave a marble monument or a statue made of brass that stands in cold retirement getting tickled by the grass. Some leave a passive portrait they've commissioned for a fee. But no one comes to sculpt or carve or paint a pic of me. Don't worry, I've been carved up by experts, not a few. Subbies form and use their knives to carve a pound or two. I've been sculpted by the cleaver winds that scream up in the struts. I've been painted by the mud and slush in bogging rick your ruts. I am a kind of portrait If you could read between the lines That mark my face with time And see just what they mean The leagues and loves and lands I've known The years of wear and tear No gypsy woman on the earth Could glean the stories there from the mullock heavy rickshaw to the hook that rides with ease. From the sucking clay coat shovel to the steel walk in the breeze. To the jack pick gun staccato to the steady chisel chip. I've worked upon my monument in a life's apprenticeship. From the Convicts pick marked alphabet in Hawkesbury River Stone to where the dog man carves his name in the concrete rise alone from mud in acres poured and squared to the dark mosaic eye. I've worked upon my monument and build until I die. I see your monuments displayed in cavalcades of war, in lands where you make ashes from the courage of the poor, in little children hobbling down to drink at sorrow's well, looking sadly at their faces cut to bits by petrol gel. I see your monuments displayed in smog-polluted air, in the wraith of black shawled mountains, in the wake of I don't care, in oil-choked harbours, upturned fish, 
and nuclear sullied seas in forests felled and deserts made from songbirds aviaries you've had your chance you've run the world your way we know it's true but your monuments stick in my craw the monuments to you we leave the cities of this world cemented with our sweat the cemeteries of our youthful years but we're not beaten yet for oh, there's a living monument to all who've lived and learned the green bands we've created and the victories we have earned and one day when our cities are but dust upon the air the pollen from our fighting hearts will bloom again somewhere and one day when our cities are but dust upon the air the pollen from our fighting hearts will bloom again somewhere The secretary of the, the media, he's yeah. taken minutes and stuff. So, uh, and I should say, um, I should say that, that I actually said that one. Um, so, uh, but before we heard um, Minus Cable, remember that one about the lottery? That was said by Brad Tate, and I should have mentioned Brad at the time. He sent it to me, he sent me the manuscript and said, I think you might want to sing this, Bob. And Brad said that to the star of County Down. And um, the pickup shed is another Bill Berry setting. Oh, I just think that's such a fantastic setting, that pickup shed. And uh, we learned it from Joe Flood and uh, he was Dorothy Hewitt's son, so we were pretty lucky there. He's been a friend of ours for 50 years. So we'll do, we'll do another one about the Green Bands. This is um, City of Green. And let's hope in May things swing around a bit <laughs> and we get some better policies to help preserve the green in this world and the environment and all the rest of it. Jack Mundy used to, we sang, I sang my name to Jack when he was uh, at his 80th birthday. Yeah. And, uh, he reminded us that uh, he'd been in the Communist Party for a decade and in the Greens for about 60 years. I built a city of green The city
As we slammed the door, we cursed and swore at the lies the press chief spread. Our blood had dried in the concrete dust, the steel fixed cut our hands. Our ears were sore with the jackpicks roar, but we could understand. Yes, we could understand. Like a giant stonehenge, this city we built. The big clown said, this shall be so, knock that theatre down. These rows of terraces shall go in the best part of the town. And they used their words to hunt me, I can tell you that they stung. I got plenty and gave plenty with my fists and fighting tongue. In a rising tide of human pride, we surged through Sydney streets. And the mark of green on the concrete king was king tide, full and sweet. Our names are known, no gold on stone, but still our hearts were high. To overturn the lives that burn the life from you and I. Took the down on me, they tipped the can. I saw the heroes point and say, Do you call it a man? But when the coppers buckled me and slammed the paddy van, I saw the heroes stop and think, Perhaps I was a man. So we're going to finish with Alastair Hewlett, who, um, who was a 
member of the ISO, uh, politically worked with uh, a group called Socialist Alternative, um, but he never wrote in the, the realist framework really, except he, he told us in a, a chorus of one of his songs, which went, it's not postmodernist, it's not post-structuralist, it's not the end of history like they promised, it's not post-feminist, nor post-industrialist, it's the new age of the fist. Post this! So that's one of Alastair's choruses, and we're going to ask Chris to sing a couple of Alastair's songs, and uh, then we'll finish off. I think he's a true inheritor of the realist writer's um, theme, because he, he wrote topical songs about uh, about struggles in the in the workplaces and all the rest of it, about the, the causes of the day. I'm thinking of, of songs like The Ballad of 1975, about the demise of the Whitlam government, which was a scouring indictment of, uh, of the, what happened there. Um, but but um, the ones, the songs I'll sing to you, the first one is, um, is about um, the rent strike of the 1930s, and Alistair claimed that he was told this story um, by someone who was there. Um, and it's one of those lovely songs that, that's, that's true at its very core, but none of the details are actually accurate. Um, <laughs> every now and then this house comes up for the sale, the house where the, where the rioters were, were eventually dragged out and arrested and has a bullet hole in the roof front, the ceiling of the front bedroom comes up for sale and they run the story in the papers again to remind us. Uh, but the rent strike was actually successful as the song reveals. You should have been there down at Erco, 14th August, Saturday night, to Newtown and Moss, and what Peterson calls when doubt workers unite. We built a bloody great wall with planks and boards full seven foot tall. We didn't mind the howling wind and sleet as we stood round the fire in Union Street. And the man from the shop said, put it on tick. The kids came round with bottles and bricks. There was Irish stew and homemade lemonade. They were grand old days on the barricade. Well, I never thought I'd join a party, carry a card or see things red. The sight of barefoot children crying out on the pavement turned my head. Their old man's over in France. Flapping like a rag on a barbed wire fence, their mum does what she can to make ends meet. And she's down at the siege of Union Street. And the man from the shop said, put it on tick. The kids came round with bottles and bricks. There was Irish stew and homemade lemonade. They were grand old days on the barricade. Well, the cops came down, and they came down hard. There must have been 500 strong. They called us reds, and they cracked our heads to teach us poor sinners right from wrong. I learned a lesson that night. It's all at war when you stand and fight. I saw them brisk young coppers on their beat. Behave like thugs in Union Street. And the man from the shop said, put it on tick. The kids came round with bottles and bricks. There was Irish stew and homemade lemonade. They were grand old days on the barricade. Oh, the sunlight danced on the broken glass. It shone like diamonds as morning broke. The cops were back by the railway track and the streets were filled with working folk. They beat us bloody and raw but it forced Jack Lang to change the law and now the landlords have to cop it sweet and the red flag flies in Union Street and the man from the shop gave licorice sticks to the kids who cleaned up the bottles and bricks down the years the memories never fade of the grand old days on the barricade they were grand old days, they were grand old days, they were grand old days on the barricade. It captures that, that gritty industrial um, inner Sydney that's sort of vanishing as we speak as well. Um, I don't know whether whether the builders' labour, I think whether the builders' labourers would have approved of that, but um, but it's uh, it's not. Alistair also wrote a song called Yuppie Town, which talks about the demise of that old inner you know, industrial uh, working class area. And this song is a later one. Alistair wrote it um, 
Coincidentally, about the same time as an Aboriginal man called David Gundy was shot at home, he was just in bed quietly and, you know, doing his, going about his, the normal things you do in bed, like sleep. Um, cops broke into the house, they'd mistaken him, his identity for somebody else. And um, in the confusion that happened in the darkened room, um, he got a couple of bullets. Um, now, Alistair had actually written the song separately about uh, just generally the way police act, but the, the, the two things became linked and he used to uh, um, always tell the David Gundy story when he sang the song. It's called The Day the Boys Came Down to Blow Him Away. They came down the back streets, the dicks and the flat feet, with dogs that had nosed his things back at Long Bay. They had a warrant, he was abhorrent, the day that the boys came down to blow him away. The neighbours were snoring, or too busy scoring. Time for the boys in blue to show crime doesn't pay. They know what they're there for, what they get there for, square for. The day that the boys came down to blow him away. And he was no fool, one of the old school. He just broke the golden rule. Topping a warder was right out of order. The day that the boys came down to blow him away. He's in bed with his missus. He gets up and pisses. He knows that something's up. He twigs right away. Just the flash of a torch out there on the back porch. The day that the boys came down to blow him away. He would never take chances round a woman he fancies. So he writes a note to say every dog has its day. Then he walks down the back stairs with his hands in the air. The day that the boys came down to blow him away. And he was no fool, one of the old school. He just broke the golden rule. And the first bullet slit him, for he knew what had hit him. The day that the boys came down to blow him away. The day that the boys came down to blow him away. Of course, of course it still goes on. People are still writing those songs about... Uh, the, the injustices to First Nations people amongst others. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much, Chris. Chris Mock. Thank you. Yes, uh, Chris has reminded me that one of the things that attracted us to the Realist Writers was their kind of dealing with universal themes as well as Australian themes. And uh, one of the first writers in The Realist was um, Kath Walker, who uh, became Uju Nunakal. And uh, Kath wrote for The Realist writer back in the first two or three issues. And Katie Noonan did a beautiful rendition in the opening concert. Did any of you get to the opening concert? Katie did a very beautiful rendition of a, of a Uju Nunakal poem. So we'll just do one more, Alastair. Hear that song and then finish with the love. This one Alastair wrote for his partner Fatima and uh, she came out here from Turkey with her family when she was young and 
This is based on her story. It's called A Migrant's Lullaby. I'm just going to get my water on It's dry atmosphere in Canberra after the mountains. <laughs> it's quite dry. Well, the wet atmosphere. Yeah. We feel like we've been living in a fish tank for the last <laughs> time. <laughs> couple of months. Yeah, fabulous weather. Fabulous festival. Yeah. The National is back. Yeah. Isn't it exciting? <laughs> it's so wonderful to be back here. Sorry. Migrant's Lullaby. <laughs>
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, we've got CDs after if you're interested. And thanks to Wayne, thanks to Andy, thanks to Robin, and thanks to Carol. We'll just do a quick one to finish. I think we've just got time. You've got, you've got 10 minutes. We'll go right back to the beginning and um, give the last word, I suppose, to uh, one of the first of the Realist writers. She never really joined, but she was uh, uh, a, a woman who edited a magazine that uh, ran in Sydney alongside Overland, which is still running in Melbourne. And this was called Outlook, a sort of socialist magazine edited by Helen Palmer, who was another school teacher. And Helen wrote a couple of um, beautiful songs because she thought they weren't very re well represented in Australia's folk song categories, uh, Ballad of 1891 and this one, Ballad of Eureka. And uh, it was the, the music was written by uh, music. Doreen Bridges, Doreen Bridges Tom Bridges' Bridges mum, mom. and you've all seen Tom in The Spooky Men, and he and does a lot of those spooky arrangements, quite a brilliant musician, Tom. And Doreen says she doesn't play the piano all that much anymore, she's under the tree. <laughs> and she played the piano for her hundredth birthday. It's on film, she's amazing. Amazing. Okay, so here's one from the, uh, the the spirit of Eureka. It's called the Ballad of Eureka. And thank you again for coming thank to you the, very much for the Realist Writers and their legacy. It's done with the 
Love you.